again to Sarah for an excellent talk. I'm hoping that the content of my talk will mesh really nicely in um, with what uh, she introduced about the ideas of sort of why we do scientific communication and getting our message about our research across. So I'm going to be talking about actually creating and giving a presentation. Um, so this will cover both in-person events, but also the more, more frequent current online arena. Um, presenting might be something that some of you have done a little bit of a, uh, before. Nowadays, sometimes at schools or on your university courses, you'll have done it. But it's probably something you're likely to need to do quite a lot um, in the future. So learning about how to write and deliver a decent presentation will hopefully help a lot of you. Um, so at this point, I'd just like to say a massive thank you. Uh, to our former colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Longford, for his help in designing the content for this talk, um, and also Dr. Samantha Kanza for additional advice on how we have developed and given our presentations over the last 18 months. So the things I'm going to cover in this talk, they're not, they're not hard and fast rules. Um, in general, these have been tailored around the ideas of sort of presenting your research. They might not necessarily be applicable in all situations or all presentations, but I hope what I talk about here gives you some ideas of things that you can do to help you with your presentations or maybe try out and see if they work for you, whether you're giving a domain specific presentation or potentially a more general presentation. So ideally, we're going to be talking about how to present well, um, but I'm going to start off by thinking about what makes a presentation poor. I'm sure we've all sat through a presentation or two um, that we think wasn't, wasn't great. Uh, potentially somebody's just put up a whole slide deck just in completely filled with text and just monotonously read off every single line on their slide. Or maybe they've rattled through their slide deck at such a speed, covering so much content that you got lost on about slide two and now you've no idea what they're talking about. Or possibly the slides themselves weren't too bad in terms of the delivery of content, but you've got to the end of the presentation and you're not really sure what you've learned or what the presenter actually wanted you to get out of the talk. So we're going to go through a bit about how we can make presentations better. So in a presentation, the key part is all about connecting with the audience to communicate your message. Sarah mentioned this a lot in her um, talk. It's all about telling your story, getting that connection there, getting your scientific communication um, message across. Now, I'll admit this is usually a lot easier to gauge when you're presenting in person or talking to somebody when you can actually see your audience. In those cases, you can see how they're responding to your presentation, maybe adjust things on the fly, try to build that connection up with them. Online, you're probably going to find this quite a lot trickier as you're often, as I am right now, presenting to my computer screen and a sea of black squares with very little in the way of feedback and response. Um, I know that myself and other colleagues sometimes struggle with this. Um, so I'm going to cover a few bits later on in the presentation that hopefully might help you to overcome that. This connection idea, it might seem a little bit abstract. Surely you just want to present some information about your research and that's what you want to do. Um, but encouraging this connection with the audience can generate a much more engaging and memorable talk. It might be something that's quite tricky to master, particularly if you are presenting a quite dry um, presentation topic. Um, but we're going to cover three areas that you can build upon to get your presentation being a bit better. So a presentation is made up from the physical design of your slides or potentially other props that you might be using in addition to a slide deck, the actual content contained within them and the verbal delivery of the speech that then accompanies them. Often people will put a lot of focus into the content of their slide deck, but they won't actually put the practice into the actual talk itself. Um, while this might work if you've given the presentation lots of times before, or if you really know your content inside out, it's not the best way to uh, prepare for a presentation. And it's better to know what beforehand what you want to say and allow you to practice it so you can ensure a good delivery. 
So I'm not going to dwell on this too much. There are a huge number of platforms available for making presentations. Uh, we've covered some of these in our talks. Um, so you can find our videos on our YouTube channel um, and we will signpost a link to these in the chat. Um, the key thing I'm just going to say here is that you should use the platform that you're most comfortable with. A lot of these um, platforms have the same core functionality, so it doesn't necessarily matter which um, one you're using. So it depends usually what you have available to you um, or potentially what information you're working with. I personally um, use PowerPoint for almost all of my presentations, um, but if you were presenting a lot of code or that's what you work with quite frequently, you might potentially feel a bit more comfortable using one of the platforms like Jupyter R or um, Git Pitch to produce your presentation. Um, so, when looking at the design and layout elements of your presentation, um, it's really good to have a consistent style and scheme throughout, as this helps to lend a professional quality um, to your presentation. Um, a key way to do this is to utilize a theme or a template and then customize this um, instead of creating each single element in your presentation separately. Um, while you don't necessarily need to have everything in your presentation being exactly the same and uniform, it can help to have to use a reduced color palette um, and uniform textiles so that your audience isn't getting completely lost in all of the elements and they can follow your content quite easily. Um, so on this slide, I show that I try to use um, fixed borders, which I've actually obviously displayed on these ones, so that I don't put content outside of these areas. Um, and I tend to put the graphics and sort of text in similar positions on the different slides so that my audience isn't hunting around for the information and um, they can easily find it. Um, graphics are really great in a presentation um, and it's key to get that good balance between the amount of text and the amount of graphics. Um, you want to try and minimize the slides that are just completely text based or without any text at all. Um, one thing you can consider is instead of potentially using like a title, um, you can display a key message, um, something that you want your audience to take away, and then accompany that with a graphical and text-based main content. Um, as you see on this slide, uh, icons can be quite a great way to include graphics uh, because they're simple. Um, you can find a lot of them online, um, and it's easy to get instant associations with some of these images. Um, but as mentioned before, so sort of other images, photos um, or graphs can also be quite powerful in the design. Uh, one of the key things that people often miss when they include graphics in um, their presentations is the idea of attribution. So there are a lot of image sources out there, but it's very important to make sure that you abide by the like correct licenses and attribution guidelines if you want to reuse the work of somebody else. Um, so obviously you can't just go onto Google and just go pinching somebody else's like images um, without providing any attribution. And often there's licenses around whether or not you're actually allowed to reuse them. You can either try to work this into the presentation design, including it by the images, or I tend to put it as a small area at the bottom for footnotes, uh, and that's where I include my attribution. Um, if you've attended the other talks in this series, and Sarah's talk just before that, um, you'll see that we all quite enjoy using comic strips as graphics in our presentation um, as a way of providing a connection to the topic that we're discussing, but giving a little bit of enjoyment into the presentation. Um, so if you're giving a long presentation, sometimes it can end up just being a bit dry if you're just constantly bombarding the audience with loads and loads of text. Um, so this can be quite a good way of lightening up. Um, also, if you have a particular interest, uh, you can try and work this into your presentation. So uh, you'll see uh, Sammy's love of cats almost certainly makes an appearance in almost all slide decks. In fact, I included one as a, a token gesture uh, to her later on. Um, so the key thing with this is ensuring that it does actually complement the topic that you're discussing. And um, most importantly that it is appropriate for your audience. Um, you're most likely going to be presenting in a professional capacity so not all jokes or comics might be suitable and if you're in doubt don't include it. Um, so as I mentioned we've all sat through those really wordy talks um, where the presenter just reads them off. 
if you do that in your presentation, you aren't really adding anything that the audience wouldn't have just got from having your slide deck. And that kind of delivery is more suited to sort of a report or an article. When giving a presentation, you always want to add something more to what is presented to the audience. And you ideally want the audience to be listening to what you're saying and not be completely distracted by your slides. So it helps to keep your graphics quite simple so that they can easily be understood. And if you have content that you want to introduce at a specific point in your speech, consider either splitting it off into a separate slide or using a simple animation that hides or shows the content when you want it. Um, but, but don't go overboard here, keep the animation simple. So unless you have the time and expertise to create high quality animated presentations, then you risk just simply overwhelming the audience with all of the effects. As you can see here, I use quite a lot of effects and I find them quite distracting to the audience. So keep it to a minimum if you actually decide to use them at all. So I've talked about the design and the layout of the presentation, and now I'm gonna move on to thinking about the actual content of your talk. Um, so obviously, uh, Sarah mentions it's a lot about the story, about what you want to tell your audience and the message. And it's crucial that you have an idea of who your audience is um, and what you want to get across to them. What you would uh, say to a group of specialists in your domain would be very different to what you might say to a cross-disciplinary group or a group of non-specialists. Ideally, you want to have a single or potentially a couple of key messages that you want to get across to your audience. And when you were thinking about different things that you're writing, like a report or um, something like that, you'd start with the structure. Um, so why not do this also for your presentation? Um, an easy way to allow you to do this is start with a completely blank slide deck in your relevant template, and then flesh out the ideas of your different topics. You can then move these around in your slide deck um, to get the story in place. So that you get that flow. And then you come back and you can flesh out the content that will go on the various slides. This avoids you just meandering randomly through a whole bunch of different topics. And what you want to do in terms of thinking about how much content you put in is design your presentation around the amount of time you have. You might encounter a really wide range of talk lengths. These might range from like a lightning talk or, as Sarah said, an elevator pitch that might be a minute or so, a couple of minutes in length all the way up to a full seminar that might be over an hour or more. The key is structuring around that length. If you only have five minutes, then clearly you won't have time to go into a lot of details. So make sure you pick out those key elements that you absolutely want to talk about. You should pace the talk so you don't spend like half an hour on your introduction and then have to rush through the entire rest of your presentation to include the content that you want. As you get more accustomed to presenting, you'll start to learn whether or not you tend to speak more quickly when you're actually presenting live or maybe more slowly, and you can work on your tempo and delivery of the actual presentation. A very rough rule of thumb that you can maybe use is about one minute per content slide. And this helps you to avoid overloading the presentation with too much content. Other things that can affect the time that you might have available include interactive elements that involve the audience. Um, so make sure you allocate appropriate time for them. They often take up a lot more time than a normal slide, especially if you have to get the audience to maybe visit a website or engage in a poll. Um, another key factor is, are you expected to leave time for questions at the end? Um, so this is probably something you might ask of the event organizers. Uh, sometimes they'll schedule a separate time for questions um, or a separate Q&A session further later on the event, but sometimes it's actually just included in your talk slot. So make sure you um, assign a little bit of time for that. Most often when you're carrying out your research, you're going to have started collecting a wide variety of information or evidence that then leads you to come to a number of different conclusions. And from these conclusions, you build up to your key statement. Now, this is obviously a very simplified view of the research process, and it can be a long and winding road getting from that evidence stage all the way through to that um, key finding. And you can be fairly certain that your audience isn't going to want to sit through every single step that you have taken on your journey to finding that statement. If they are, 
then that's an excellent discussion that you can have with them after you've given your presentation. So instead of guiding them through your research process, consider flipping it on its head. Maybe you can start with one of your key statements. And then as you get into your content, you can break this down into diff several different conclusions. Um, and then you can include not all, but some of the evidence that you use to reach this conclusion. Here, you really want to consider who your audience is and then plan what information you might include relevant for that audience. Maybe you won't go completely into niche details and you don't need to cover all of the details. They can always ask follow up questions after the presentation. So Sarah mentioned this in her talk, so I'm not going to go into this um, in, in a lot of detail. Graphs are a really powerful way, but Hopefully, if you've got any sort of background in data analysis, you'll see that some of I mean, all of these are terrible graphics in terms of actually presenting the data. Uh, this could be a whole talk in itself. We hope to actually run a session on data visualization um, later in the year. Um, but just as Sarah said, so avoid misleading your audience kind of in any way, whether that's axes, formats, annotations, lack of graph labeling, pie charts that go to over 100%, uh, flipped axes, all of these sorts of things are really poor um, ways to visualize your data. It can be really, really powerful um, to visualize your data um, through the use of a graph, but you need to make them clear and easy for your audience to understand the data. And if you can represent the data that you would have put in a graph in just a single figure, then you probably don't need to use that graph. And instead, you can just present that as a single figure. So I've covered about some of the things about the content. Um, and so it's the importance of getting your message across, making sure that you're clear in how you do this. And now I'm going to move on to the actual sort of delivery of the presentation. Um, so one thing to consider is that the way that you present your work is also an extension of your work. Um, so take ownership of your presentation and try to make it a little bit individual. You don't want to just be going up and giving a presentation that's simply a clone of everybody else's presentation that you've also heard. Um, how you do this is something that will evolve as you get more experience with speaking. Um, as Sarah mentioned in her presentation, it's all about communicating a good story. So you need to think about how you can work that story into what you've got as your research content. Um, don't be afraid to inject a little passion into your talk. So you've worked hard on the content that's going into your talk. So be proud of doing this. Um, another way that you can potentially mix it up a little bit um, is to involve the audience. Um, again, this can be a little bit harder online, uh, but you can do some interactive activities, potentially ask questions of your audience or do polls. Um, and these are sometimes easier done in person, um, but do factor these into your timings if you do decide to use them so that you don't end up rushing the rest of your talk. One of the best ways to ensure that you have a presentation that does actually fill the time slot that you've um, been assigned is to write a speech that accompanies your slides and then practice, practice, and practice it. Um, this is really important if you have a specific time limit for your talk, but it's also really useful even if you don't actually have any restrictions. You want to try practicing it in front of the mirror or recording yourself presenting it. Um, it can be very weird watching yourself back. Personally, I absolutely hate watching any video recordings of myself, but it does help you to see what your audience will see and hear. And from this, you can improve the timings from your slides and how you might want to vary your tempo or tone of voice. Um, if it's particularly important, you can always ask to present to some supportive colleagues and ask for their feedback. Ideally, try to mostly learn your speech by heart so that you're confident in your delivery without having to continually rely on your notes. But don't panic if you're presenting and you forget a bit. Just take a look at your notes and just carry on, pick up and carry on with your presentation. So as I mentioned, video recordings is great for practicing your talk, but it's also great for capturing the output of an event or 
um, such as we're doing currently. Um, and it's also use, potentially useful if you're not comfortable presenting live or if you can't make a live presentation and then you can provide a video recording instead. It also helps to improve the accessibility of your content. Um, so you can add site subtitles or allow different speed and volumes of playback on a video recording. Uh, it's not always something that all of us are comfortable with. So you can help prepare yourself um, to do this. So in terms of preparing your area, you're going to want to check that your microphone and camera are set up in a decent location. So I use a headset so it doesn't pick up lots of um, background noise. And I've located my camera so that the audience doesn't just end up looking at the side of my face whilst I present to my computer screen that might be over there. Um, ideally, you want the camera positioned so where you're going to be looking at it and your microphone will be able to clearly pick up your voice. Um, try to put yourself into a well-lit area and that's from the front, not a backlit room. Uh, with a simple background behind you. You can um, always use a virtual background or blur your background if your computer will support that. Um, if you're capturing the recording yourself, uh, then you can, there are lots of software available that will allow you to capture and edit it. But if you're doing this as part of an organized meeting, then it's likely that the video, uh, the organizers will sort the video for you. Uh, so as Sarah said, um, if presenting to an empty room isn't uh, something that you're particularly comfortable with, uh, then you can have your co-workers. Uh, so I also have a crocheted animal uh, that will come. They usually sit above my webcam. I have three of them and I can present to them instead of just presenting to a blank screen. Um, and that way I get a bit more comfortable. But having said that, I still get nervous about presenting, even after having given more presentations than I can remember. Um, so don't worry if you do still get nervous, just, yeah, we all get nervous. Um, if you are pre-recording yourself, uh, then you can do it several times, um, but remember that presentations don't have to be perfect. Um, so don't spend hours and hours just going over and scrutinizing little bits of your presentation. So that's most of the presentation, the preparation in advance of your presentation, but just in the final run up to actually doing the presentation, try to get a good night's sleep. I'm sure we've all done it, but you don't want to be staying up late the night before your presentation, doing like tiny little edits and last minute practices. Your presentation will almost certainly take you longer to make than you think it will. Um, so try to give yourself a bit more time to make it in advance. Um, if you are staying up late, late before your presentation finishing off, then for the next presentation that you do, try to do a little bit earlier. Um, you probably don't wanna eat or drink too much directly before your presentation, as that can sometimes make you feel a bit uh, bad when you're actually giving the presentation, but make sure that you've had a decent meal a few hours beforehand and that you stay hydrated. You can always keep a little drink of water near you so you can have a drink whilst you're presenting. Because sometimes if you're presenting for say half an hour, you might get a little bit of a dry throat. Give yourself a bit of time to get yourself set up before you actually do the presentation. If you're presenting in person, when we finally get back to that, it's always worth checking what connections are available at the venue and bringing your own adapters. You would not believe how many issues are caused at conferences due to this. Um, also bring a copy of your presentation on a USB stick and maybe print out your notes just in case you have any technological problems. Um, as Sarah said, uh, wear something that is professional as it looks, but also something that is comfortable for you to present in. Um, although you are mostly hidden when you're presenting online, don't go presenting in your pajamas. Um, and specifically for virtual presentations, there are a few more preparations you can do. If you have more than one device or more than one screen, as I do, then you can always set up, say, your video conferencing like software on one screen, your speaker notes, a copy of your presentation so that you can see them all at one time. Also make sure that you turn off your notifications, both on your computer and on any other devices that you might have nearby you. And let anybody that you live with know that you're presenting. So you don't have people just randomly walking in during the middle of your presentation or deciding that that's when they want to do band practice or something like that. Um, do check in advance to make sure it's all set up properly and you're gonna know which screen or window you want to share. Um, 
I've been to many presentations in the last year where we've either been sat watching the wrong screen or stuck on the first slide of the presentation because it's not actually progressing through that. If you're not particularly comfortable with a screen share, ask the audience organizer in advance if you can do a technical check before your talk. They'll almost certainly be happy to do that so that when you get to the actual presentation, everything runs smoothly. And if you are nervous about speaking, you can try to warm yourself up uh, before your talk to help yourself relax. I know you're all muted, but you can feel free to join in with this at home. Uh, one exercise that you might be familiar with is the tongue twister, red lorry, yellow lorry. And then you can extend that to other variations such as a red leather, yellow leather, or red lorry, yellow larry. And obviously repeat these um, as much as you can before you get them all wrong. And that will help get your voice warmed up before talking. Um, if you're someone like me, who tends to gesticulate um, or make weird motions with your hands, then feel free to keep like something, maybe like a pen in your hands if you do want to minimize your hand motion. Um, when you're in person, do try to move around a little bit when presenting. Obviously, don't do that online because otherwise you'll just end up missing out of the uh, video frame. But if you are presenting in front of a lectern, you don't need to necessarily stand behind it the whole time. You can move about um, the area as you speak, but don't go pacing up and down in front of it. Um, so I've covered a lot of things, but once you've got all that content creation and preparation under your belt, try to enjoy yourself. So you're gonna be talking about something that you've invested a large amount of time studying or working on, and hopefully it's a subject that you actually enjoy. Um, so we want you to enjoy talking about it as well. Doing all of that preparation in advance, is gonna give you the best chance of actually being able to relax and enjoy the presentation, safe in the knowledge that you have good content on your slides and you know what it is that you want to be talking about. 